Coming out. My name is Michael Washburn. I'm the interim director of public programs here at the Graduate Center. And on behalf of the entire Graduate Center community, I'd like to thank you all for coming out um, to the final program in our year-long exploration of New York's creative economy. As many of you probably know, the Graduate Center is a school of arts and sciences, a center for applied and theoretical research, and a platform for performance, conversation, and public debate. As a community of students and scholars committed to the idea that learning is a public good, we regularly offer public programs featuring eminent thinkers, cultural leaders, and distinguished artists addressing today's most pressing concerns. And to that end, um, we've been delighted to present a series called Cultural Capital, The Promise and Price of New York's Creative Economy, which has been an institution-wide public programming initiative that's explored um, the city's creative and knowledge-based industries through an array of conversations, panel discussions, um, music performances, and screenings. Um, so we've been dealing with from music to publishing to arts organizations and tech startups. New York's obviously long been vital to the creation and consolidation of the creative and cultural industries throughout the world. And throughout this academic year, we've been exploring those in other fields. Um, tonight, as we bring the series to a close, we're going to look at one of New York's signature industries, fashion. To lead us through the discussion this evening, I'm delighted to welcome our moderator, the Graduate Center's own, the Graduate Center's own Eugenia Policelli. Eugene is a professor of Italian comparative literature and women's studies at Queens College and here at the Graduate Center, where she also directs the fashion studies in the Master of Liberal Studies and in the, and the PhD concentration in fashion studies. She's the organizer and co-curator of the exhibition, The Fabric of Cultures, Fashion, Identity, and Globalization. And her books include Moda e Moderno, Fashion and Modernity from the Middle Ages to the Renaissance, Fashion Under Fascism, and Beyond the Black Shirt. Eugenia will introduce our panelists, but I need to do two more bits of housekeeping. Um, toward the end of the evening, we'll be taking questions from you uh, out of consideration for our videographer, for our panelists, and for your fellow audience members. Please use the microphones at either side of the auditorium. Mm. And finally, Stella Bugby, the editorial director of The Cut, who was supposed to be on the panel, is ill, and she could not make it this evening, so I apologize for that. Um, and that's it for me. Thank you very much. Please join me in welcoming our guests. Mm. Thank you, Michael, and uh, your office for organizing this. And thank you, and good evening. Um, I am very happy we uh, have this, our distinguished uh, guest uh, tonight. And of course, uh, as Michael uh, explained, um, this year um, there were many events uh, focusing on the creative economy in uh, New York City and of course fashion is central uh, uh, to uh, the city in New York as a global uh, fashion uh, city. Um, New York and also the Graduate Center uh, are at the forefront of fashion and fashion studies uh, as Michael was, um, was uh, mentioning before, um, we have uh, um, a PhD concentration in fashion studies open to all doctoral students enrolled in the different programs at the Graduate Center, and also a track in fashion studies in the Master of Arts and Liberal uh, Studies. And of course, if you're interested, uh, uh, you can check the website, the Provost website, and also the website of the MALS uh, program. So. Um, uh, tonight's uh, fashion event, uh, as I said, is one of the um, many events uh, we have organized on fashion here at the Graduate Center over the years. And in fact, uh, we have had the pleasure um, of welcoming Dr. Valerie Steele as a guest on several occasions uh, on, uh, here at the Graduate Center. But I remember especially her participation at our first academic conference that focused on Italian fashion, held in the same room back in 2002. And Gabby S. Four also has been uh, a guest on more than one occasion, one, once as a member of a panel on fashion and power uh, with Guy Bay of the New York Times, and another time at the launch of the issue of the journal of Women's Studies Quarterly dedicated on fashion and published uh, by the CUNY uh, Feminist uh, Press. And Maria is, one, is uh, here for the first time and I would like to give her a special uh, welcome uh, tonight. Uh, so I uh, would like now to introduce uh, the speakers uh, and, and then uh, I will uh, uh, give the floor uh, to Dr. Valerie Steele who is the first uh, speaker. 
So uh, Valerie Steele is director and chief curator of the Museum of the Fashion Institute of Technology, where she has organized more than 20 uh, exhibitions since 97. And uh, I must say she's been instrumental uh, for all her work uh, in establishing uh, fashion studies as a, as a modern field of studies interdisciplinary within academia. And she is the founder and the editor-in-chief of the journal Fashion Theory, uh, published by Berg and now Bloomsbury uh, Academics. Um, she's also the author of a dozen books and uh, curator, uh, as I said, of wonderful exhibitions uh, on uh, um, queer, I, I, I'll read because uh, there's many, many of them. Um, and some are also linked to, to a publication, a Queer History of Fashion from the Closet to the Catwalk, uh, Yale 2013. Um, fashion designers, uh, uh, AZ, the collection of the museum at FIT, uh, the Impossible collection of fashion, uh, the Daphne Guinness uh, exhibition, uh, Japan Fashion Now, Gothic, uh, Dark Glamour, and there's all books uh, published by Yale University Press. And Dr. Steele actually uh, did a PhD at Yale in, uh, in uh, history. Uh, so I will now uh, introduce uh, uh, Gabi S4, uh, uh, who is part of the Fashion Design Collective 3S4 and established, was established in 2005 with fellow designer Angie and Adi. And it's a sort mm -hmm. of interesting uh, trio because uh, Agi, Abi, uh, Gabi comes from uh, Lebanon uh, uh, and I think Angie from Tajikistan and Adi from Israel. So it's quite interesting uh, combination. So 3S4 consistently creates silhouettes inspired by na the natural world, the anatomy of the human body, plants and animals whose graceful forms exemplify perfection in design, balance and motion. Blurring the lines where fashion meets art, 3S4 employs a multidimensional approach to cut and construction to create collections that redefine classical tailoring. And some of his work uh, was in exhib the exhibition at uh, the Jewish Museum last, uh, last fall, and I think he will talk about that uh, in, in a moment. And so I'm delighted also to introduce uh, Maria Cornejo, who was born in Chile and moved to England with her family when uh, she was a child. And a varied career spans London, uh, Paris, Milan, and Tokyo. In 1998, she transformed her own space in Nolita into a highly creative atelier and store known as Zero. And from the beginning, Cornejo established an independent point of view and developed new ways of cutting fabrics based on the simplest geometric forms. And she will also talk about that uh, tonight. So this simplicity and easy freedom in her design have become her calling card and the champion of women in the fashion industry and beyond. Her work is guided by the idea of creating wearable luxury for real women. And I think one of her customers is also Michelle Obama, if I'm not. So welcome to join me to introduce. Uh, I think uh, uh, Dr. Steele will start. Sure. Well, I've got my thing, so I guess I can sit here if you can still mm -hmm. hear me. Mm -hmm. um, New York's been a fashion city for more than 150 years. It was an enormous port with skilled artisans and craftspeople manufacturing in stores. But right up until the 1930s and 40s, it was overwhelmingly derivative of Paris fashion. The, clothes that were, the women's clothes produced here were essentially copies of French fashion and the men's clothes essentially copies of British fashion. Here you've got a Claire McArdle piece, and McArdle is famous as being sort of the originator of the American look. Yet she said that back in the 1930s, she did what everyone else did, which was copy Paris. Nevertheless, certain key retailers started to advance the idea of promoting American fashion as early as the 30s. Unfortunately, they didn't usually mention the names of the designers. So Elizabeth Hawes complained, you know, who are these anonymous American designers? A bunch of robots hidden in the back room? Because the French designers were all known by name. It was really only during World War II when Paris was occupied by the Nazis and there was no more fashion news coming out of Paris to the Allied countries 
that um, American designers like McArdle really got a chance to start to flourish. Get the next picture. Now, McArdle was sportswear, but Charles James was the epitome of high fashion. Nevertheless, quite apart from his own personal genius and neuroses, James was um, in a difficult position in the US because the manufacturing system in America was all geared towards ready to wear and mass production. He didn't have the kind of support system of, a, of the couture the way it existed in Paris. So although what he made overwhelmingly was couture, he kind of had to do it in isolation. Get the next one. I'm not going to go through at length with each of these. Most of them will be background. But here you can see Norman Norell's uh, mermaid gowns. And these are, are, again, an example of the very, very high quality ready to wear that was produced in New York in the mid 20th century. Every single sequin was sewn on by hand. Whereas today, if you buy a, a beautiful sequined gown, it's all on by machine. And if there's any tiny little tug on one of the threads, the whole string of sequins comes off. With this, that never happened. Get the next one. Uh, back to sportswear, which is more what New York was known for. Bonnie Cashin here, a Californian who'd worked in the Hollywood film fashion system, uh, and then came to New York and started making interesting functional clothes, which still drew a little bit on her ideas of Hollywood costuming, that you were dressing a particular person for a particular role. And as you notice with this coat, huge pockets with big sort of industrial fasteners, because she thought that you couldn't possibly want to go anywhere without carrying a paperback book with you, and you needed a pocket for that. Mm -hmm. Next. <laughs> Diane von Furstenberg, we're moving closer to the present. Um, and one of many examples, as we'll see, of people coming from other countries to become designers in New York. Because as New York became a, a, a fashion, a global fashion city, it naturally attracted people from elsewhere, in her case, from uh, Belgium. Next. Stephen Burroughs. There was a recent show about Stephen Burroughs, an, an important African American designer. Um, had a show up at Museum of the City of New York. And Burroughs is probably most famous now, I think, not only for being a pioneering African American designer, but also for participating in the so called Versailles Fashion Show in 1973, which was the big kind of battle between the New Yorkers and the Parisians. It was set up as a, a fundraiser to help Versailles, and it took place there in Paris had the best uh, French designers like Saint Laurent, Ungaro, et cetera, and then a handful of Americans, including Stephen Burroughs and Halston, Bill Blass. And the French were great, but the Americans were fantastic. <laughs> and it, it was really interesting, because the French actually mm -hmm. totally sabotaged the Americans. They wouldn't let them practice. They, and so the French had elaborate sets. The Americans had nothing. And they came out, though, with the models dancing, and they had much more pizzazz, much more sense of modernity. And that, I think, was the first time for Europeans, and maybe even the first time for a lot of Americans, that people started to think that New York might be the equal, or even possibly the successor to Paris as the capital of fashion. Next. Halston was the quintessential New York designer during the 1970s. And we're actually working on a show for spring 2015 where we're going to pit Halston against Yves Saint Laurent. So it will be a direct <laughs> New York versus Paris in those yeah. 70s years. We we're also forward. working on a show next year in the Fashion History Gallery, which will be specifically on fashion's world cities. So the subject of New York versus Paris, London, Milan, Tokyo, and now dozens and dozens and dozens of other capitals around the world, from Copenhagen to Kiev and from Sao Paulo to uh, Johannesburg. Fashion weeks are popping up all over the world. Can I get the next one? I'm not, not going to keep naming them so much for now, but I'll, I'll emphasize a few ideas. Oscar de la Renta here from the Dominican Republic. But more, you can keep moving them along, not too fast. Uh, you'll, you'll, recognize, you'll recognize most of these people. Uh, if you have, can't recognize this, you're not studying New York fashion. Uh, but when you think of what is New York fashion, 
it's a question which is difficult to answer because to what extent is New York City about New York City fashion about New York and to what extent is it about a particular style of fashion? Are there really different styles in different fashion capitals now, today, in the 21st century, as opposed to in the 1970s when it was clear to say modernism versus decoration? Um, there's certainly different structures in the fashion industry in different places. The American system is still very much structured towards manufacturing and usually large-scale manufacturing, although, as you'll see here, we have a lot of really exciting independent designers in New York as well. And in recent years, New York has been in the forefront of um, being open to independent designers and allowing them a space. That's been a big problem in other capitals like Milan, where certain giant oaks prevent other acorns from growing around them. Also, the question is, how much of New York fashion is just a question of image or reputation? And how much is reality? Europeans always say New York fashion is just commercial. It's not cutting edge. Uh, to what extent is it commercial compared to a more artistic Parisian fashion, for example, or Japanese or English? Um, there have also been a lot of American designers moving over to show in Europe. So it's not just that we have people coming from all around the world becoming designers in New York, but you've also had a migration uh, in the other direction. So you've had people like Tom Ford at Gucci, and for many years, Marc Jacobs at Louis Vuitton. Um, every time there's a New York Fashion Week, there are big signs saying, New York City, fashion capital of the world. But the question is, is that really true? And what does it take to be first among equals amongst these many fashion capitals. I think the, the thesis of your whole program has tended to be that metropolitan modernism is really closely associated with fashion culture. And I would argue that that's true. Mm. Cultural production is definitely an urban phenomenon. It's not just a question of designing or manufacturing clothes in a particular city. Mm. It's a question of a whole a uh, life of cultural and economic activities that take place in one place, which form the basis for a kind of aesthetic, uh, an atmosphere for aesthetic innovation. When I did my second book on Paris fashion, a cultural history, I talked about how fashion was, Paris was the fashion capital for more than 400 years because mm -hmm. it had a culture of fashion. Mm -hmm. People thought fashion was important. Poets and artists thought it was important. And um, there were knowledgeable performers and spectators who looked at what one another were wearing. So if you went to the opera in Paris, you see there's the huge staircase at the old opera. You were there looking at what everyone was wearing coming mm -hmm. into the opera, going out at the intermission. And you had people on stage wearing costumes by famous couturiers in Paris. It was, the whole world was a stage there. And you have to think, to what extent is that true? In New York now, do you have these knowledgeable spectators, performers? You certainly have a concatenation of cultural agencies and institutions and individuals here. In fact, just as it's been said that New York stole the idea of modern art from mm -hmm. Paris in the mid 20th century, it's been argued that New York also stole the idea of modern fashion from Paris, establishing ideas about functionalism and modernity, urban life, which the French were possibly, some would say, less eager to follow. There are also, of course, lots of fashion professionals in a city like New York. And this is part of the networks that any designer or creative person needs. You can't, it's hard to be an artist if there are no gallerists around, if there are no art collectors around, if there are no museums around. The same thing is true for fashion designers. It helps to have stores, retailers, reporters, bloggers, journalists, people who rush into their favorite store to get clothes early, as soon as it comes in. You need that kind of atmosphere or excitement to build an arena within which fashion can flourish. Historically, if you take the really long view, 
fashion has followed power. I, when Spain was the world's ruling power, Spanish fashion dominated all of Western Europe. In the 17th century, when Paris became the capital of France, which was the most important populous country in Europe, French fashion conquered not just Western Europe, but around the world. Then to the extent that um, America began to grow in power and importance, American fashion gained at least a foothold on the stage of world fashion. But there's been a constant series of challenges back and forth. Milan, as well as New York, rose in the 1970s. And Milan was known for a kind of luxurious version of sportswear. In a way, if America was mass manufactured functional sportswear, then Milan seemed to be where you'd get that incredibly expensive for the 1970s, $400 sweater, you know, from, from Crizia, something that was sportswear but really suave and stylish. England has kept re-emerging, London periodically during the 60s, then again during the 70s with the punk era. There's been a constant flood of designers out of London to Paris, partly because of the fashion schools, and I haven't mentioned schools, but fashion schools <laughs> are another important component in what makes the fashion system really lively and functioning. So all of these are elements of what makes a city a fashion capital. And as we'll talk later in conversation about the kind of things that have made New York a fashion capital, um, this will come up back and forth. There's no single re answer. Mm -hmm. I tend to feel that uh, Paris is still probably first among equals, uh, based on there being more designers from around the world who want to show in Paris, more reporters who come to Paris, but there have been increasing numbers of people also who want to show in New York, and not just individuals, but whole cohorts, mm -hmm. like when the Belgians swept into Paris in the 1990s, and at first everyone laughed. The French laughed and said, how can there be Belgian fashion? That's like an oxymoron. But they stopped laughing when the Belgians started to become very important avant-garde fashion designers. Now the Koreans are sweeping in en masse to New York, as well as a handful to Paris. London is trying to scoop New York, though, in that area, making an effort to make London be more welcoming to designers from around the world. Milan has been kind of stuck. They're trying now to do what the U.S. has been doing for years and helping to promote and support younger designers. But it's still very much a work in progress. They're still trying to launch more good fashion schools. Mm -hmm. And for example, they stole Linda Lopa away from Antwerp in Belgium and brought her down to Florence, Florence, which was a brilliant coup because she was one of the most important fashion design education of people mm -hmm. throughout Europe her students all became famous and successful designers. Mm -hmm. So this was a great attempt to establish Polymoda in Florence as a major fashion school. Mm -hmm. um, here you see Ralph Rucci, who does a very kind of rarefied high fashion. He was completely ignored in America until after he showed in Paris at the Couture in 2001. Mm -hmm. Then, only after that, did American fashion journalists and retailers pay any attention to him which sadly seems to imply that even today, the imprimatur of having shown in Paris and at the couture can have an impact on the reputation of an American designer. And we can just move quickly through the next few. We have Isabel Toledo, who came from Cuba. Mm. Next, we have Tom Brown. Mm. I've, short, I, I've shorted the uh, menswear designers here because my expertise is more on womenswear designers, but New York is also becoming a center for menswear. Mm -hmm. Next, Yoli, who came from Malaysia. Next, Narciso Rodriguez, the child of Cuban immigrants. And finally, Marc Jacobs, who's probably uh, as well known for his work in Paris as in New York, but who now owns a large segment of Greenwich Village. Mm -hmm. So this is just <laughs> a small, a very fast introduction to some <laughs> highlights of American fashion history. Uh -huh. Thank you. Thank you, Valerie. I think uh, I will... Uh, this was <laughs> wonderful. Uh, you know, Rich really gave us uh, an incredible, concise uh, and rich uh, history of New York I'd like fashion. To follow and then now. we'll uh, uh, follow 
with Maria talking about your, your own work and so the concept uh, behind your work. And I started in New York in 1998 with a very small space in, on Mott Street. Originally, not really wanting to be in the fashion business, to be honest. I just wanted to have a creative space and try to figure out a way of cutting that would be, that would feel interesting and new to me because I had, I had got quite bored with fashion. Because you were in London before. I was in London and Paris and I had my own collection in the 80s with John Richmond, which did really well and it was part of the big hype in London at the time. We did shows in Tokyo, you know, with the, Mark Jacobs, everybody, it was like full on fashion. And then I went the other way. I wanted to just start from scratch. That's why it's called, it was named at zero. I wanted to start to make something without any preconceived ideas and without any history of what I'd done before and just for people to take it as face value for what it was. Mm -hmm. if, if it had any appeal, it was about their, you know, the very immediate appeal. It wasn't about press, it wasn't about hype. It wasn't about the connotations of what I'd done before. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't attached to anything. So it was a little naive on my part, I have to say. <laughs> but I wanted to make something interesting and find a way of making it exciting for me again to, mm -hmm. to be making things. So I started with a very simple idea, which I think is at the time I just had a child. Um, you know, my father was dying. I had the, the space sat empty for years. I had time to think about it. And I kept thinking, mm -hmm. well, what do people wear? I mean, I, people just wear jeans in New York. Everybody wears just jeans and shirts. So I thought T-shirts. And I thought, I'll start making couture T-shirts. And from that came, OK, well, yeah. I want to make T-shirts out of these very basic geometric shapes, which is a circle, a mm -hmm. triangle, a rectangle, a square. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, and to just create from those simple shapes and, and, and while putting them together, that geometry, the, the, what the contradiction in, it would make in the movement. Mm -hmm. it's, some, you, you, well, it's a very black see. dress right now, so you can't really see anything. Mm -hmm. But um, mm -hmm. so for me, it was always about, always about, you know, putting a straight line against the curved line and see what it mm. would do and, and what the reaction would be. and, and the, Simplicity, I thought it should be about the woman's body, that the shapes once on the woman's body, it would become about the woman. It's not about the designer anymore, it's how the woman feels in the clothes and how it touches certain parts of the body and it, how it emphasizes, hopefully, the best parts. You know, I'm a woman, so I sort of tend <laughs> to try and camouflage things and, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and, and sort of to find an interesting way of constructing. And as the collection has evolved, it's come from very simple, very basic fabrics to more, you know, luxurious fabrics. Mm -hmm. and as how do you choose the fabric? I mean, how do you go about I that? I go to, um, I don't do PVA, any of the fabric first, really, because I don't really want to know what everybody is doing. I mean, for me, ignorance is bliss. Mm -hmm. Creatively, the less I know, the happier I am, because I find if you have too much information, it's almost crippling. In this day and age, if you're a designer, you have to have your own identity. And I think the only way to preserve your own identity is to remain a little bit in your own bubble mm -hmm. of thought mm -hmm. and creativity. And, and so I go and look at fabrics at the agents. And then from the fabrics, I look at them. And then I, they sort of demand the shape, in a way. And I drape with them. Mm. And from that, you know, um, we drape on a model or a mannequin and take photographs or I sketch it. And then... It it's, gets a put into, it's a process, it's a process. Yeah. yeah, and it's an evolution. You know, there's certain things that have been in the collection from day one that started mm -hmm. off as a square dress, and the way the neckline was cut, it meant that it draped in a different way. Mm -hmm. Now it's in the 15 year with a plissé on the side, mm -hmm. and the plissé gives it a wing effect. Do we have to move the other the slides, right? Is it? I don't know how to move them. That's, <laughs> this is the lead jumpsuit, yeah. mm -hmm. which another thing which I love. I'm a, a great believer in jumpsuits for women because mm -hmm. it takes the work away from thinking about what you're wearing. You just put it on, you dress, you're done. I mean, this week we've had an amazing press week because Christy Tellington has been photographed like four times wearing one of my jumpsuits. Wow. And each time a different one. And it's, <laughs> it's a working women's wardrobe. And I always say it's like a sexy mechanic look. You just put it on and you... 
and sip it a little bit. You put your lipstick on your heels yeah, if you're yeah. going all out, or you. But it's you interesting know. that the uh, you know the jumpsuit uh, was uh, we were talking before about the futurists, but also the constructivists. You know, they yeah. uh, sort of work where. Uh, I like the idea that things uh, have a use. That you know, I I hate the idea that fashion is just to be looked at. I think it should be worn. If a dress isn't worn, it's not lived in, it isn't appreciated. And of course, there's some beautiful pieces that you know you can't wear all the time in, in people's collections. But I like the idea of being able to wear everything and not, you know, and, they be, and, and that what becomes interesting is the fact that you are wearing these pieces every day. They're not sitting somewhere. Exactly. So they sort of um, They become part of your part lifestyle. Of you, part of your life. Yeah. Yes. It's about lifestyle for me. And I think that's what. For me, it's interesting about New York. It is about lifestyle. It's, people really wear clothes here. Women really work, and they go from day to night, and they, you know, they study, they, they're intelligent, they're doing things all the time. You know, we have a big following with the creative community, with artists, and they're sort of, they're working women. They're not arm candy. These women don't have time to overthink what they're wearing. They just want to put it on and look good, and they sort of trust me as a designer to help them with that, right. in a way. Mm -hmm. With the way the clothes are constructed, in a way that they're flattering and simple, and you just pull them on, and they don't have to think about it too much, and then they put a belt on if they want to, or mm -hmm. they don't. And I think that's the thing that's become appealing to, to, to my clients, I say, you know, because I think it's just the easiness of it. They <laughs> put it on, and they forget about it. But also there is sophistication. I mean, this is, yeah. I mean, it's not just the pure minimalism. It's there deceptively a... simple. I mean, I always say to people, it takes a lot of effort to be mm. that simple. Exactly. <laughs> it, takes a, <laughs> it takes a lot of thought to be that simple. You know, I, I don't think I could drape, you know, like that. I mean, you need, you need certain skills to, to, to Yeah, to and create. I think, you know, I've lived in different uh, cities and different countries. You know, I've, mm. I've worked in Japan. I worked in... Italy, I worked you know, in the factories in Italy when I used to th make a collection there for other people. I lived in Paris, and I think from each place I've taken different things. But what I love about New York is the fact that it's made my clothes wearable. I want to wear them every day. I don't just dream about them. The things that I want to put on, I get, you know, like this. I love this fabric. I've been wearing it every day. I, it becomes like a uniform. I just throw it on. Mm -hmm. And for me, for once, I'm actually wearing my clothes all the time, which is for a designer, you know, you don't usually get to do that. Of course. Uh, no, thank you. Um, why don't, um, yes, <laughs> they want to. <laughs> uh, Gabi, now, why don't you talk us about your, your work? I think we have a video. <laughs> this was a little bit of an accident here of a yeah. uh, cell phone, I guess unfortunately. Uh, yeah, I'd I rather the video can speak better than me.
wonderful. Can you can yeah. you talk about this? Uh, As uh, Eugenia was saying, I'm part of a, a fashion collective. Um, I work with through two other ladies. Mm -hmm. And uh, this video actually has been a breakthrough because we've been showing at New York Fashion Week for fall and winter consecutively for the last 25 times. So we are not used to not showing in New York Fashion Week. And this was the first time we had to get over showing physically um, as a runway show that is physical. So we realized that um, by doing a, a virtual runway show, uh, we we will reach the same amount of people anyways. And since the world has become one, uh, the best way is to have something on the internet um, that is more powerful than a physical fashion show. Because physical fashion shows have a very limited kind of setting where you have people sitting on two sides and you have some kind of lighting situation from the front and the back and there's a background. Um, so for us, this was a huge kind of step because we could put the girl into the environment um, which we controlled. Um, so because for us, the fashion is more of, of a performative um, situation. We believe in that fashion is performance art and uh, the environment is as important as the clothes. I feel like if you see something not in, in the fitting environment, then it doesn't really translate the message completely. So this uh, video was uh, kind of scary for us because we never did that before. <laughs> but actually it was from the response that we got, it was the most successful um, of fashion shows that we had, especially because we put the clothing in white. And mm. since we knew that we would have a virtual uh, environment, we focus more on, uh, on depth. Uh, what you see in that fashion show was um, a 3D fractal uh, animation, which is uh, only done with the help of uh, some nerds that we have around. <laughs> 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 um, some some of them are here. genius people. <laughs> <laughs> that, uh, so this was a huge challenge in terms of technology because um, basically, it, 3D fractals were, were kind of a new thing that was happening, but n never was a person put inside the fractal. So it was a tremendous effort to, to put a person inside a fractal and make the person move with the fractal movement. So, so um, a fractal, by the way, is a geometric pattern that is repeating uh, to to the, the uh, ma micro and to the macro. So it's the same pattern that repeats to the smallest and to the biggest. It's kind of like what nature is about. Mm -hmm. And this, as you see on the screen, this was the another example. The, the installation? The, yes, the, 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 this was uh, something, um, this was kind of a big opportunity actually that we had. The Jewish Museum uptown in New York approached us to create an environment and because they realized that we also were, were getting more involved in technology and we were also very attracted to um, mathematics and so we, they asked us to create an environment um, in the museum that was bringing architecture and fashion and uh, projections together. So here we collaborated with an animation artists and with, an with two architects. One of them did the structure, which is um, basically a star tetrahedron. Um, that, was, that, that was actually a structure you can go inside. Uh, it's basically the Jewish star in 3D. And to, mm -hmm. be, to, to be able to create it, we had to put a mirror floor because the, it was, the space was not big enough to create a full star. Mm -hmm. So we created a mirror floor uh, based on the flower of life. Uh, because the flower of life is actually in all of this. Um, it's basically the, the essential structure of that shape. Um, mm -hmm. The star tetrahedron is um, the shape that contains all platonic solids. Anyways, I'm not going to get too nerdy, but uh, <laughs> the, this is the inside of the star. Uh, we wanted a space that kind of like uh, was kind of a self-reflection where you go inside and you see yourself 
for eternity, kind of these funhouse mirrors, but it's too typical to do funhouse mirrors. So we felt that the star tetrahedron uh, with all mirror would create something because uh, it's related to vibration. So we heard it was working. This is a 3D, uh, this is laser cutting that we used for that, for that show. Basically that show started with a runway show that, start, that was in New York Fashion Week last September. And it was and, at the Jewish Museum. And it stayed at the Jewish Museum for the next, until February of, of this year. And this is another laser cut dress and all of these dresses are based on tiling systems. Um, and the tiling systems here come from uh, churches, synagogues and mosques. Mm -hmm. and this one is Islamic laser cutting pattern. Mm -hmm. And this one is origami um, folding, which brings a little bit of uh, Eastern influence into it. Uh, again, another origami um, folding pattern. Because in this collection, we wanted to, uh, it was a, our first attempt into 3D printing, which was a huge uh, uh, challenge for our team. And we felt that there had to be a transition between old world and new world, that it cannot just be technology all the way, that there needed to be something that connected it. And origami folding of fabric was the kind of a perfect bridge. This is a 3D printed dress uh, that was built, uh, made out of uh, three weaves, and each weave was based on tiling systems from each of the religions, Islamic, uh, Jewish, and uh, Christian. And um, here's the dress from the side. Then, and here's another one that was uh, based on uh, fractals. And uh, there's two types of fractals here. There's a Sierpinski fractal, uh, which is based on triangles, and um, a hex fractal, which is based on hexagons. And um, this weave was basically a study for us to start understanding what is future of fabric. Uh, so basically it's chain mail, but uh, instead of chain mail that is flat, uh, in 3D printing you can achieve chain mail that, that can work much more in, in all directions. So it's almost like achieving chain mail that can move in six directions. And we believe that this can, this is a very great, uh, at least uh, proposal for future fabric, because once this is printed in a micro scale, um, it can create fabrics that can have agility that was never possible before. Mm -hmm. um, here's the ladies at the end. Um, you can see the 3D printing close-ups. By following uh, the geometry of nature, you somehow right away relate to uh, something that is more in the cellular organism or that is even like soap bubbles or clouds. So it's all the same geometry at the end. How heavy are those dresses? Because uh, I, I, we have one 3D dress at the museum, and it, they're so cool looking, but they're still so still fairly heavy, right? No, this is very light. Actually, those look light. The the okay. challenge is the challenge, at least for my team, the challenge was to to work like nature works. Mm -hmm. So you use the the maximum uh, empty space oh, okay. and the minimum physical yes. space. Because mm -hmm. then you're using the space properly. Right. So the properties of the space, so you get the best strength, yes. mm -hmm. is to use the, the maximum empty space. It's brilliant. the same like yeah, how like nature bubbles, is. Of course, the brilliant, That's uh, brilliant idea. So they're actually really light and they're really fle flexible. They move like uh, they they move on the body really nicely. Uh -huh. So Gabby, these are eventually these fabrics are going to be able to be like more fine and like you said. Well, the technology is not there yet, but I feel like in a, in like about five years or so, mm -hmm. um, because now they have to develop these technologies because they're printing organs and mm -hmm. uh, like tissues for, for the body. Right. So I think the moment that one of the big companies of fabric, maybe DuPont or somebody in that caliber we'll decides invest to invest into. Mm -hmm. into a 3D printer that can print in cotton or wool mm -hmm. right. on a micro scale. So it's like nano. The revolution. Yeah, it would be a revolution. It's kind of like what uh, what Lycra yeah. did for fashion. Yeah. Um, That's right. When it came out in the '80s, and now everything has Lycra. So it's. And is each dress constructed, printed in separate pieces? 
It was um, printed in one. Well, unfortunately, because of the, the limitation of the printing box, mm -hmm. it because they're quite small, aren't uh -huh. they? Yeah. We had to print it in separate pieces, but it's designed as one piece. Mm -hmm. But then we had to separate it, which was very painful and very mm -hmm. torturous of how to put mm -hmm. it back together. How do you put them back together? Um, well, we Glue. created these clipping Glue. clipping units mm -hmm. for the for the uh, for the chainmail mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. dress. We had to create these units that clip, mm -hmm. almost like a keychain clip, that that had to come in between. So they became like a sewing thread almost. Incredible. And the other one was kind of put together with thread, mm -hmm. but it's really solid thread. Uh, to be able to hold the three-dimensionality. So you work with somebody who's super technical on the computer mm. to actually design the piece and then they figure out the, the program, yeah. which this goes to the printer. Yeah, basically, I, I cannot do this, and none of my say, team... Because I wouldn't even know where to yeah. start. This is done through an architect okay. who is also interest, very interested in fashion. Mm -hmm. And this is done through many, many um, obsessive nights. <laughs> Yeah. To, to, rea to also be able to, to let go that you have to, um, after making it something in 3D as a whole model, you have to figure out how to open it up and cut it in pieces and put it back together. Yeah. So it's almost yeah. like pattern making. Right. So you, almost, you have to cut it and make sure each piece is straight enough that it comes back in a really nice shape. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's like a giant 3D mm -hmm. jigsaw puzzle. Puzzle, basically, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but there's a lot of research, I mean, in, in terms of, you know, redefining, you know, fashion within space, fashion and architecture, fashion and art, fashion technology. So this is really interesting. And I wanted to sort of connect what Valerie was saying mm -hmm. before regarding fashion and New York. And you said, you know, is how do you define it? Because, you know, New York is thought as a city, you know, sort of com commercial, you know. So, but, you know, your examples here are, very, very different. I mean, there's a lot of research, there's a lot of cutting edge uh, um, design and experimentation, conceptualization. So I think that's very, you know, I would like to I know what think you think you know, about this idea of defining. I mean, I think uh, personally, I've lived in different countries and, and I think the, the being a foreigner somewhere gives you a lot of freedoms mm. because in a way you don't have to fit in. Mm you can come up with your own way of doing things. Mm. Mm. And if you're not part of a system already, then that gives you naively a sort of freedom to just mm. do your thing and a create. zero degree. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> or naivety, you know, which is it's an energy. And I think New York gives you that. And, and the, the reality is that, you know, New York is a very, you know, when I opened the store, they were very open. They, they, they were curious. They want to mm. come and look. They want to try things on. That it's not like Europe is much more snobby about fashion. Mm. If you're not well known, if you're not this, if you're not that, here people would just walk in and say, well, what's That's this? Mm -hmm. Well, historically, mm -hmm. of course, New York fashion system has been heavily fed by immigrants. Mm -hmm. First Jewish immigrants right. from Eastern Europe, then lots also of Asian immigrants, of Latin immigrants. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's an interesting phenomenon because it implies that as different immigrant groups come in, they each have various turns at the fashion business before mm -hmm. moving on to something else. It's sort of, in a strange way, it's like, okay, you could have your grocery store, your, you know, your newsstand, your fashion business, and then you're on to another thing. Yeah, and I have to say New York is the only place in the world that you can get pretty much a coat, a pair of pants, le leather pants, a fur jacket, whatever you want except for shoes within a 20-mile radius, which is unbelievable. Nowhere else in the world can you do that. You can't do that in, in Italy. You have to travel to a different, you know, take a three-hour train ride to go you, to a factory. Do you mean to buy them or to have them made? For, have for them made, have them made. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of freedom in the fact that you can walk around the garment district and buy fabrics and get things made or get something embroidered. And mm -hmm. it's amazing. Nowhere else, I mean, that I've worked in, mm. there's that freedom. And in fact, you know, mm. you're raising an, an important issue here mm. because I've attended some panels uh, mm -hmm. also with other, you know, designers discussing exactly this. I mean, this idea of the, you know, the garment district, the history, mm. and it's also the, the problems now, of course. Right. Uh, but the fact of the proximity, 
it's the not proximity there. and also there's the, there's a lot of artisan and craftsmen mm. like, like Valerie is saying that have come tailors from from Italy there's a lot of Italian tailors and mm -hmm. there's Korean sample makers there's there's a whole different cultures that have come and set up shop or factory and ateliers within that 20 mile radius which is unbelievable you it doesn't exist it doesn't you know, exist anywhere here. else in fact this is i think it's quite unique of new york to yeah. have you know, that in a, in a very uh, small space if you think although with you know, the with the that. economics of making clothes mm -hmm. it would seem inevitable that just as shoemaking went abroad to asia and to south america that almost all fashion except for high end niche fashion mm -hmm. would have to go out to be made in China and then, mm. you know, Vietnam and then South Africa. And you'd have to keep finding cheaper and cheaper places to make it. Mm -hmm. Because until you get a new manufacturing technique like yeah. 3D, 3D <laughs> printing, you basically have sewing machines mm -hmm. and a very, very old technology, which is very labor intensive. Mm -hmm. And the only thing that will keep it down is mm -hmm. make, manufacturing it mm -hmm. in a less expensive mm -hmm. country, which would imply that if you're thinking fashion follows power, maybe then the next century is the century of Chinese-dominated fashion, since the vast majority mm -hmm. of textiles and clothing in the world is made in China. They mm -hmm. haven't got so many famous designers yet, but it's got everything else. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of, uh, I think, uh, complexity in this you know, global, uh, uh, global um, picture. You know, I was reading, for example, I mean, it's been for a few years now, the uh, Louis Vuitton, for example, has invested in um, buying a whole huge space in Italy near Venice to manufacture shoes, you know, employing, uh, you know, craft people who mm -hmm. are able to, to make, you know, this, uh, these shoes. So those are $1,000, $1,500 yeah. shoes. Most people uh, buying $40 shoes no, no, are going to be but made But what I'm China. saying is, 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 you know, you have different yeah. levels and different geography and different ways of, uh, so I'm wondering, for example, for the garment in, uh, mm -hmm. district, you know, going back to this, uh, what, what do you think, you know, from your perspective is, is there any future that he can uh, survive? I mean, or, uh, I, I think there's, there's two different counts. You know, I think if you are in the, I mean, I'm an independent designer like Gabby is, and if you're, we're not rough around, we're not making thousands of units. Right. You know, we're making anything between 25 to 150 to 200. It could be anything like that. Um, personally, I like to know who's making my clothes. Mm -hmm. And if people are paying a lot of money for clothes, they should know where they're being made mm -hmm. and but who's touched them. Mm -hmm. uh, I like the idea that things are made locally, even though the fabrics that we're bringing them in from Japan, from Italy, from France, we're, we're getting custom jacquards made in Italy, we're getting custom yeah. stuff that's made everywhere. But we're assembling it in New York. And to me, that it's a luxury, but we're selling a luxury product. Mm -hmm. It's not for everybody. Yeah. But it's a luxury, you know, like I remember being on holiday once with a guy who worked for Hermes, and he said to me, you make in New York? I said, yeah. He said, my God, that is the most luxurious thing ever, mm -hmm. to have everything made in New York. Mm -hmm. I said, yeah, actually, I hadn't thought about it. It is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. And people sort of beginning to appreciate, like even, you know, a lot of, I think, trends come from food, like local, organic. Yes, yes. yes. And so yes. it's sort of slow passing food, over into slow food, yeah, slow, you know, food the, the, slow fashion, mm -hmm. things, from, and know, appreciating things and being able to touch them. And, you know, and I think mm -hmm. there is a future. I mean, it's not for the, the big, you know, a lot of the big companies produce, produce the, you know, like the factory I work with also produces with Marc Jacobs, produced part of his collection. And yes, some of the, uh, the other things they make in Italy or they make in China, it depends on the, on the price point. There's, there's many price points in all these right. collections, right. so there's things for everybody. But I think also, then I want to know also what Gabi or mm -hmm. Valerie uh, think, mm -hmm. you know, the, linked with this idea of the digital you know, technology. It's interesting that, uh, I mean, I'm noticing, is it true? I mean, people really want to know more. You know, it seems to be a more, uh, people are more conscious, but they want to really know 
uh, more about a particular object. Uh, if they are buying this object, mm -hmm. you know, there's more knowledge. Uh, I mean, than yeah. before, you know. Uh, and and I'm wondering if this is also uh, due to a, a larger awareness, you know, because of the presence uh, um, of you know bloggers, uh, uh, other kind of forms of you know uh, media in uh, getting into the mm -hmm. uh, you know object information describing. Uh, uh, but also, you know, I'm thinking of certain movements, you know, craft economy. <coughs> so there's, there's really something going on that I think it's interesting. Yeah, I think we think? live, I mean, we live in a time of homogenization of mm -hmm. fashion mm -hmm. where mm -hmm. um, the sense of belonging has reached the mass. Mm -hmm. um, people are very self-conscious. They're not really ready to venture out into it. Uh, in their individuality, they would like to, mm -hmm. we, they would prefer to belong. Mm -hmm. So then that type of fashion is kind of ruled by um, stores like uh, Hennes and Moritz and mm -hmm. Zara and mm -hmm. uh, Mango mm -hmm. and Uniqlo. Mm -hmm. and, and that type of fashion is something that Maria and me can never compete with. It's we kind can, of like an of out of our way. We compete with ideas. That's yeah. the only way we can compete. So this is basically the bottom line. For anybody for, like us to actually survive in this uh, environment, we have to be individual. So our product has to be individual. Otherwise, we'll be forgotten in two seconds because we will not be able to survive if we yeah. attempt to, to do that competition. Plus, we will also look ridiculous. I mean, it, mm -hmm. It will not, it's not really us. So I feel like in terms of manufacturing, it feels like if the world changes in going more into individuality, which I think is going to be dependent on the press, if press promotes individuality, which means it's a social movement, it's not going to have to be anything else but that. Mm -hmm. If that's promoted in the next years, mm -hmm. then people like us will be promoted as well more. And then manufacturing on a small scale will be promoted as well. So kind of like local food. Yeah, shift. Yeah. It's, it's, hopefully, I mean, mm -hmm. you know. That's what I feel. But I feel like there's been an enough of homogenization that for somebody like me, I mean, I, it, it feels to me that it has to shift. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like the part of the big shift that's happening. But also the, you know, the death of many people you know, the Bangladesh tragedy and other mm -hmm. tragedies, I mean, this is something that, uh, you know, it's impossible to, 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 to now know. we're in the 21st mm -hmm. century to think that there are, you know, these kind of situations, that there are the repetition of what was, you know, like New York in the, in the, in the beginning of the 20th century when immigrants, you know, from Europe uh, were working in uh, mm -hmm. shirt factories uh, with no escape, you know, and it's, it's uh, where are we going? <laughs> right? that these are issues that, I mean, I'm very concerned with these issues. Mm -hmm. That's why like we used to produce in China and mm -hmm. I, I, my partners and I said we cannot do that. So we, we pulled out. Mm -hmm. And we used to produce in Turkey, we pulled out. Mm -hmm. It's been a long process of trying to. Mm -hmm. And the best place we produced abroad was Japan. Mm -hmm. I felt Japan and Italy were more Mm -hmm. Places that were okay in terms of the ethics, mm -hmm. work ethics. The, uh, I also think you know the issue of identity. Perhaps mm -hmm. uh, we could. Uh, uh, this could be the last question, and we can open the floor to um, you know if the, if the, if the audience. Uh, uh, well, the issue of identity. Mm. Yeah. I mean, r in recent years, uh, my magazine Fashion Theory has published a number of pieces about the ethics uh, and sustainability of the fashion system as it's currently constructed. And the evidence of, of a shift in attitude is mixed. Mm -hmm. uh, you definitely find a growing niche interest in local, sustainable, ethical, uh, and individual uh, fashion design and manufacturing. But you also find overwhelmingly among young people a feeling that they give lip service to it, but then they're out at the fast fashion mm -hmm. uh, brands every week that shopping That's is the hobby. Mm -hmm. So clearly it, it hasn't really sunk in, which isn't to say that there couldn't be, because we know 
in the in the 60s there was a great movement away from the fashion system as it then existed mm -hmm. so it's possible but i'm not quite sure what would trigger such a change i don't really see the press as ever doing more than reflecting prejudices mm -hmm. rather than changing them mm -hmm. um, but it's certainly going to be one of the most crucial issues mm -hmm. Yet for me, it feels like it has to be a social consciousness. It cannot be anything else. And I don't really know. I just, you know, I mean, I hope for it because humanity has to become more aware of its environment, oh. I think. So, oh. but whatever but happens. Perhaps happens. also the schools, I think, uh, they have a, yeah. an important role uh, yeah. in this. Not only the fashion schools forming uh, new designers. And I know you, you also teach. Yeah, I teach at <laughs> Parsons. Yes. Uh, but I think also schools in general. Mm. Uh, and, I, and I think also the idea of studying fashion mm. in it, what you were saying at the beginning of our conversation in a, in a wider uh, perspective uh, in these historical connections, uh, 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 social, uh, cultural aspects. So then you sort of become more aware of this. Uh, big um, monster, <laughs> you know. Uh, but in, to go back to your, the sort of originating question about New York as a fashion city, uh, historically, in order to be a world-class fashion city, you do you have had to manufacture as well as right. design clothes mm -hmm. there. So although people have talked about you could have New York be the center because of designers and retail headquarters and so on. Ultimately, there seems to need to be some grounding, and you actually need to know how to make clothes here okay. and, and actually produce some of them here to have it really qualify. I have to say, a lot more designers are moving to show in New York. I mean, this is just mm -hmm. a comment. That, That's true. Uh, also, because New York is at the beginning of the season, and years ago, Helmut Lang decided to show in New York, so he because it used to be the story that everybody thought New York was last, so New York would copy Europe or whatever. So when Helmut Lund pu pushed it all to the beginning of the season that New York would be first, it meant that a lot of innovation, people wanted to be here. And also, it became every year now, to be honest, New York is still one of the most affordable places to show. Mm -hmm. So That's keep true. in mind, Two is when the buyers have all their budgets at the beginning of the season. So they all come and they have their open to buy at the beginning of the season. And three, there's no central like Sham Syndical or like the British Fashion Council. You know, and here anybody can come and put a fashion show on. You don't have to be approved. You can, which is a bit crazy and they should regulate it a bit more to be honest because every <laughs> Tom, Dick and Harry is having a show here now. And they should give priority to like New York-based businesses, to be honest, I think. Uh, so it, it's become a very, there's like 360 shows a season here I now. I think more, yeah. Which is <laughs> unbelievable. By the way, in, in the year 2000, there was about 20. Yeah. So mm -hmm. it's, yeah. It's a That's big another yeah. interesting, uh, interesting. So everybody's pushing and for time, for space. Uh, you know, it's harder and harder to get for yes. people like us to show because also big companies like Montclair or yeah, yeah. Burberry, so Dior did a show last night. They come with big budgets yeah, and yeah. they take up the spaces, take up the slots. And then a lot of very commercial companies that don't really need to show are also doing the same thing. So the mm. New York fashion also has become a lot more bigger because of that, because of the fact that it was open financially for a lot of people to just come and say, okay, I want to do a show here. Whereas everywhere else is a little bit more regulated. Mm. It, it was a bit like the Wild West, I think. Mm -hmm. Well, certainly the, the popularity of shows. Yeah, interesting, this as idea. Just also. so you know. Mm. <laughs> the popularity of shows as a spectacle has been central to the proliferation of fashion cities. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Everybody wants to have a fashion show, and preferably a Mercedes Benz fashion yeah. show. Right. Yeah. And that's and what you'll have then in Mexico City or Kiev, et cetera, because that has established you as some kind of a fashion city. Right. But also the business that go, you know, I mean, tourism and... Yes, you get huge economic and press. And local I mean, and it social. brings so much money to the city. I mean, you imagine all those buyers the and economy. press and designers and teams staying in New York, paying for hotels, shopping, Practice. eating out. I mean, it brings a ton of money to the city. But if you're based here, it's also very hard because it brings a, a lot of... 
I wouldn't say competition because you know it's not even about that. It's it's more about finding a space and having a slot and just you're you're all shouting for the same budgets for the same attention in a way, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's very competitive. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, I think uh, uh, we have uh, we have some time uh, for uh, questions uh, from uh, from the audience. Uh, thank you, first of all, very much. Yeah. And so, yes. Hi. Um, I was kind of uh, surprised to, uh, when I saw the video. I said, I'm looking at it, I said, that looks like fractals. <laughs> um, my, my main interest is in the, role, the increasing role of technology in, across the board of, in jobs and, and what we do and how our, we lead our lives. And I was wondering if you care to speculate on, you mentioned 3D printing, on uh, the role of technology in, in design. Uh, uh, will there be algorithms creating designs? <laughs> um, I mean, I think it's unavoidable to have technology come into fashion. It has to, because it brings so much advantages. It, it saves time, it saves money, but also it creates so much excitement because it's entering a new territory each time. So I, I feel like it, because of all these factors, it's unavoidable that it will actually get more and more into fashion. Well, we did a show a couple of years ago on fashion and technology, which looked at 300 right. years of mm -hmm. technology's impact. Because um, actually the, the Industrial Revolution was founded in large part on textile manufacturing. Exactly. Um, the Luddites objected. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. in recent years, you found it primarily through things like computer-assisted design or the internet being a new way to retail and to show fashion. One of the most interesting things that um, my colleagues found, we did a symposium about it, and there's a woman in England who's working on what she calls bio-couture, mm -hmm. which is essentially growing the clothes. Uh, made out of bacteria. It's like a sci-fi novel. Um, and so they grow, and, and she hasn't got the funding yet to have them grow in the shape of the garment, so she has to cut and sew them together still. But she gets the great, like these rugs, flat pieces of bi uh, sort of biological material rather than something which has been woven. But uh, bi biological material, as you mentioned, is, is fractal. It's basically similar, self-similar on many different scales. And a tree, for example, is a fractal. Yeah. So that bio uh, technology kind of fits in there. Can, can we go my, to the next question? My question okay. goes to Gabrielle, Gabi. Um, you really provoked my thoughts when you said that the social consciousness, um, the sweatshops in, in Vietnam, for example, or in Dhaka, uh, and you wanted to leave because you reacted to that. But the other side of the question is then, what happens to those people who are really making a, li a livelihood with you being there? And if you leave, then who's going to bring the food to their table? It was just a provocation of uh, your thought. I looked at the other side of the question. Yeah, I mean, there's so many people not having a choice but to manufacture in, in the East. So there's enough clients for... No, I'm sure, but it's, enough work, it's, a, enough. it's a thought, no, <laughs> to see, yeah. you know, what happens if you leave and those people need to, li to have a, a living. Um, yeah, I think the amount of um, uh, the influx towards the East with manufacturing has been so crazy in the last few years. Oh, yeah, sure. They have more and more jobs, and China has become more expensive, actually. So People, to, to be economic, people have to go to the Philippines and Indonesia to be more economic. So it's definitely not a problem to get jobs there. Well, in response to that too, I think it indicates the need for an international movement to enforce higher wages because right. it's true. Yes, it, is, it has to be international. One sec. If you think about the people demonstrating in Cambodia because they're only making $100 a month, and you realize that that was $100 more than they were making before. And I've seen that in Indonesia. The factory job's better than the farm job. It's better than the job being a maid or a prostitute. But it's still a crappy job. And if you can get support from outside to make it $300 a month, 
that's what you should be aiming to do, that's that ultimately. Right. That's, mm. Yes, thank you very much. Mm. Hi, uh, thank you so much for your reflections and uh, designs. Uh, so my question is a little bit provocative, and maybe I'm wrong, but I find a kind of contradiction with if you think about traditional centers of fashion, kind of uh, like New York, London, Paris, but it's, but it's also some of the worst dress cities in the world. I mean, look at you guys, you're just all very black, and you're like designers. Okay, I'm kidding, right? But, you know, but compare New York to like Moscow or Tokyo or Milan, where like people are reinvesting and there's just much more variability. So there's this kind of really funny disconnect. But then I have more crazy question, you know, so you're talking about like growing fashion. I think the real art form of 21st century is going to be body design, and people will start modifying bodies. I mean, of course, you wouldn't need fashion in 50 years because you can just modify bodies, program web now, technology, you know, change colors. So, um, so I think so the second question is more crazy, but how many decades fashion is left? Uh, well, historically, well, if you ask me as a historian, I'd say that all the predictions of fashion disappearing in favor of uniforms or nudity have failed, yeah. as have the, all the Absolutely. predictions that it would go back to some timeless kind of oh, non-fashion. Yeah, exactly. Yes. So there seems to be something in the human psyche that feels that the naked body is not enough to express your individuality. It's in a sense more dehumanized than being able to create with clothing or decoration a persona. I, mean, I, think, I think I wasn't implying that you know, people will be naked. In fact, you know, they'll be fashionable, <laughs> yeah, but yeah, yeah. You'll, be, you'll be programming <laughs> with fashion yourself through some kind of biotechnological things, yeah. right? So, so fashion and the body will kind of become one, right? So this idea that you kind of put these things on you, I mean, I think we'll still be, everybody will become designer, we'll just not be putting pants anymore, right? And what about you guys wearing black? You're not setting a good example. What about, what's, what's up with that? I, I, I personally, you know, it's my uniform. I work with color all day. I've been working with color and fabric all day. I just want to disappear, you know? Yeah. It's like cleansing of the palette. Mm. If I can add uh, uh, I, uh, a little bit to this provocation. Uh, ah, no, sorry. No, I, I just have to tell you, uh, in terms of creation, there's nothing that can beat the human body. The human body has an ultimate beauty that no matter what kind of clothing you make, it will look cartoonish, uh, you know, in comparison with the anatomy. So that's what I believe. And if, I don't know if that answers any questions. <laughs> <laughs> Well, let's, uh, I will, yeah, Hi. Uh, the interest in the uh, fashion industry in New York has never been greater, as evidenced by the attendance we have here, and uh, people I see running around the garment center today, it's unbelievable. The, uh, the changes that have happened over the millennia, since 1624, when uh, New York City was first started, um, are all, uh, uh, come to an apex now that has never been more uh, significant with the internet and Zappos and, and the Amazon and all of this new stuff that nobody ever heard of before and design is able to, to, to uh, create a, a full fashion item right off a, a knitting machine. Uh, Stoll makes this knitting machine that uh, unbelievable stuff that's happening in technology. Um, but how did we get here? Why did it all happen? I just wanted to say, I wonder if you know that the Fashion District bid sponsors a free tour of the history of the apparel industry in New York City, given mm. by a really knowledgeable, good-looking guy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's good. <laughs> we can help you out to uh, just get in touch with them, and they will uh, give you some of that information. Nice. I, I hope you knew about that. Yeah. If not, yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 I did. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, I think we have a question. Um, hi, my question is uh, related to what Valerie was talking about at the beginning uh, of the evening. Uh, you were talking about different uh, international uh, location cities, fashion cities, and uh, I'm a PhD student here at CUNY. Uh, I am in the Spanish and Luso Brazilian uh, program, and my question is not only for you, for all of you, um, uh, related to uh, what's your um, what designers from, from Spain do you think are cutting edge or are uh, avant-garde these days, if, uh, if any? And what do you think is the role of Spain in the warm-up, fashion warm-up? Thank you. 
the others may have more knowledge about cutting edge Spanish designers. The ones I can think of of Spanish designers, although they're good, I wouldn't say they're particularly cutting edge. I would think that Spain, if you have fashion shows in, say, Madrid or Barcelona, it is good for the fashion community there. It's good for the community of designers and fashion students and consumers there. It's good for the economy of the city. But it's probably unlikely to be drawing much international attention. So whenever I travel somewhere, whether it's Copenhagen or Cape Town, and people say, what should we do to make our area a fashion center? I say, go for it. Try to make your city a fashion center, but realize that it's just going to be a launching pad and that then eventually the best designers, ideally in a little cohort with government support, will decide we want to show in Paris or London or New York or Milan and will go but with enough capital behind them that they can really try and, and put on a show, even if at first it's just a group show. Because the poor fashion journalists and retailers are now traveling more than a month uh, to, as they go from New York to London to Milan to Paris. And it's just going to be only a handful of them who are going to go on further to Spain or to Tokyo. They usually use a stringer mm -hmm. who's in those cities. They won't even send the big ones because they're just exhausted. Um, I think it is fascinating to see what special things you can find and the special atmosphere in different cities. But I think it's unrealistic to think you can be more than a local regional center. Um, that might be one way to grow beyond Spain per se if there was enough effort put into it so that, say, other Latin countries uh, got sponsorship to show in Madrid or in Barcelona as well as, say, in Mexico City or in Colombia. Um, or maybe Spain and Portugal, something like that. I told the Japanese you should try and bring in more from around Asia, because at least you have a few people showing here from uh, other countries, and a few people are visiting. And they have started to do that, probably not because they listen to me, but probably because it already occurred to them. In the last couple of collections in Tokyo, there have been lots more Indonesian designers and really interesting young ones who weren't getting any world Thanks. press mm -hmm. in Jakarta, but who were finally getting it in Tokyo. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder if any of you two has any ideas or any thoughts um, on this. I mean, I have somebody in mind who, but it's an old example that applies to today also, Cristobal Balenciaga. Um, if he didn't show in Paris, he would not be Cristobal Balenciaga. So that's. I mean, I, I feel like it's the same today. It's not that different. Mm -hmm. And Andrevar had to come to New York and so yeah, on. Mi yeah, Miguel Andrevar. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. There was Sibella as well, who doesn't... Um, you know Sibella in Spain? Mm -hmm. Great, brilliant designer. Yeah, Sibella is a great designer. She was, but, but she's pretty much stopped. She doesn't Sibilla. really do it anymore. She's yeah. coming back. She's actually opening she's a new coming back again. Yeah. Well, but good, because she was brilliant in the 80s. She was one of my favorites. I'll tell yeah. you a funny story. I was writing my book on women designers, and it was pouring down rain, and I'm in the subway wearing a Sibylla raincoat that I'd bought in Madrid. And this very elegant Spanish woman came up, and she said, I like your raincoat. And I said, well, thank you. It's by Sibylla. She's this really wonderful Spanish designer. And she said, well, she'll be very pleased to hear that. I'm her sister-in-law. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, will you please tell her to answer my letter? I want to interview her for the book. <laughs> And she ended up on the cover of my book. No. You, sh so you should. Only She's in New York. Is this kind of yeah. <laughs> situation. I think. Uh, is there uh, somebody? So this question is triggered by when you were talking about the sequins on the dress, how it was um, the handmade and it was sewn individually, mm. uh, unlike how it's manufactured now. Mm. So as technology is becoming more prevalent, I was wondering. Um, what about those skilled workers? What are your thoughts on them? Because I hear about how um, fashion houses like Dior, Yves Saint Laurent, they're the ones who can actually afford them and um, other companies can't n anymore. And also um, with age, they're not um, p passing on their craftsmanship skills onto younger generations. I think that's a really important issue. And some big luxury companies like Hermes are putting a lot of money and effort into that because really skilled craftspeople are central to creating exceptional fashion. 
um, and they're disappearing. <clears throat> but they mm -hmm. still do exist, and they need encouragement and support to spread what they know how to do. Mm -hmm. um, in Japan, there's a system about um, na living national treasures, where they're supported and encouraged to get apprentices who will t they'll teach what they know. Mm -hmm. And there was when I visited Cambodia, there was a Japanese man who had set up what he called the Silk Granny Project where he went around the country looking for old ladies who still knew how to spin and, and weave silks. And so that he brought them to Phnom Penh and paid them to teach younger women how to do that, to keep the skill alive, and then also to try and get it so they're producing for a living wage and more because they're creating things which are not just sold for $3 in the market, but that actually will fetch international prices. Well, um, I'm a budding designer, so I was just wondering, um, when I own my own company and, and such, uh, what would you suggest in terms of cost and um, helping out skilled workers like that? The, Franca Sozani is doing a big thing with the UN about trying to connect artisans in the what used to be called the third world with fashion companies. And there are a couple of other groups that are doing the same thing. If you Google, you should be able to find some because there actually are lots of, of co-ops in different countries where mostly women are being trained to with craft skills that, that fashion designers would really like to be able to utilize. And they're set up to be co-ops for the women to make yeah, a living I, wage. And it's just, I mean, we work with a, a women's co-op in Bolivia who does all the hand knits and um, we support them because I, I really be I'm South American, but I really believe in supporting people like that so they can keep going because the craft is there. And, and you know, you can't, for me, that's what luxury is, is things that have been touched by a hand oh, yeah, sure. and, you know, that I've had time and thought put into them. Uh, you can get a sequin top from H&M for $30. You can buy a couture one for $30,000, you know, there's different, everything now is available at different price points. It's how it's made, where it was made, and the quality of it that changes. But, you know, you can pretty much find anything at any price point, except for 3D printing, which is really <laughs> It's still expensive, but it will get oh, less but expensive. It's still, yeah. You know, it's still... Yeah. Like computers. Yeah. I'm old enough, I yeah. remember how they used to be huge and expensive. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, do you have a question? Hi. Um, I'm a very, very loyal shopper of uh, Maria Cornejo. Um, I'm, Thank you. I'm very loyal. It hurts my wallet, but, you know, <laughs> it's totally worth it. It's totally worth it. Thank um, you. So uh, being a global brand and really selling on a national scale, do you find that you have to target your customer, whether she's in California or New York or Paris? I mean, do you... Do you vary your designs accordingly, or is it just like, as you said, symmetrical shapes or numbers? I, you know, it's funny. We were just today. We did a fitting, and there's certain things that you know are universal with women, and a lot of the collection is really meant to be seasonless. You know, parts of the collection don't have a season. They, you know, the problem right not the problem, but the reality is that you know women travel. They live all around the world. You know, one week they're in China, the next week. You know, the, these women are busy women. And we sell to the Middle East. We sell to Texas. We sell in Austin. We sell in Miami, California, you know. And then there's the whole thing that the collection is pretty seasonless and light and packs very small. And then we have the reaction from, like, the Europeans where there's no heating, that they want heavy wool <laughs> and That's heavy always... pants, you know. Whereas here in New York, you wear things that are very light in the winter. Inside, you just cover with these ginormous jackets. Yep. But the reality that, you know, yes, there's certain things that we do really well in the Middle East now because I do a lot of my things are not body specific, this color. That's what I love about it, though. Thank you. Yeah. And so it becomes about the person. They belt it. They do something to it. So it's a bit more universal. And I think that's, that's what appeals so, yeah. because it's not about one woman is about many women. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Hi. I just want to first congratulate and just say how much I admire both Gabby and Maria, their purest nature and um, the use of technology um, going forward. But my question really deals with um, the effect of social media on your businesses and um, 
how it has changed and if there's been an evolution. Uh, uh, Maria, you spoke a lot about um, remaining in a bubble and um, being pure to your own aesthetic. And yeah. I, again, I admire and congratulate you on that. But I'd like to know how um, uh, social media and uh, how prevalent it is has impacted your businesses. Um, you know, there's, I, to be brutally honest, there's two Instagrams. I have my personal Instagram that is private, and there's a company Instagram. I have a personal Twitter account that never gets used. Because I, to be honest, for me, it's like a, I don't have the time. And whenever I think of something, I always think it's like endless self-promotion or it doesn't sound cool. I always think, you know, I'm also for me, English is a second language. So what I'm thinking and what comes across sometimes doesn't make sense. <laughs> and so I always sort of censor myself. But there's a company, Facebook, there's a company, Instagram and Twitter. And um, I have to say, we look at it. I mean, I don't think for a company like ours is, of course it helps, but the sort of women who are buying the clothes that, you know, it's not like they're waiting for Twitter to tell them what's cool. Mm. You know, it's, it's, I think the whole Twitter thing is younger, and I think when it's used for the power of good, like this week we had, you know, Christy Turlington's been wearing the clothes, and I always say to the girl who does, Kyle who does the press and does all the, all the social media, I said, Let's be cool by association. I don't, you know, I don't think, want things to be cute. Let's talk about Christy Tellington doing something really good in the clothes, or M Michelle Obama, whoever it is, rather than talking about, oh, this dress is really cute. How, you know, how, I don't know, I, from, from my generation, it's a little bit like you're talking Enough. down to people. So I think it's definitely important when you can mix it with something that's real, and it, it comes naturally, but when you're, you know, personally, when I see it, it was just used constantly for selling. It, it, it doesn't bide way, well with me, personally, because that's not the way I am. And I think a lot of my clients also don't look at it that way. But I think it definitely has a place. It really does. I mean, people look at... Uh, I went to a perfume event, and the best-selling perfume right now is Justin Bieber and... <laughs> yes, don't get me going. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, and Taylor Swift, <laughs> yeah. because they have the She's most nice. Twitter followers, the 15, 14, 12-year-olds. Yeah. And it is that generation who want everything that those people produce mm. or anything attached to those names. I think we have a different following, and I think it's, yeah. it's, it's just a different time. I think it's different levels of it. Mm. I mean, I'm happy to support on Twitter and Instagram if... The other night I went to see um, one of our clients who was one of the 15-year artists, Carol Walker. She did an installation at the Domino Sugar Factory, which was amazing. Mm. And that, I'm happy to go there and see her wearing something and put it up on Instagram and Twitter because it's real and it's based on something that I respect. But I find that, personally, I don't have the time and the endless feed of stuff that I don't know how anybody has the time for it, you know? Yeah. But I think also for me, it's a, it's a generational thing. I see my daughter, who's 22, and she's Instagramming all the time. She's Twittering all the time. They have the brain that works on all those different <laughs> levels. Mm. I just don't. I'm working, and I'm not always on my computer or something. So I just think it's a real generational thing. Yeah. And that's how it influences. It depends on the generation. With women, my age is more when it's more social media, when it's something that means something to them that they're closely attached so they can aspire to, like a course or a designer or a person that they admire, um, but they don't want to be spoon-fed stuff. And I think younger, is, is they have a short hand which they can just pretty much follow each other and understand their own language, but I think it really is about the age differences mm -hmm. as well. I hope that answers your question. Certainly, yes. And Gabby? I agree with Maria. <laughs> uh, <laughs> And the, it's kind of interesting because this, the word like is used so much. It, also how we speak today, we put like in every, every sentence. There's maybe two times you put like. So it's kind of a new way of talking. Um, and as, like Maria was saying, there's a generation gap. Yes, but the hashtagging. I don't the hashtagging and all of that. But 
I, I learned that let the kid who knows how to do it do it uh, if I like the kid. And uh, I, sh I, also, I also have to get over this fact of, you know, I'm like, uh, for me, it's, it should be for everybody. So the more likes, the better, I guess. Um, but I'm still getting used to it. I, I'm kind of confused. At, in the, so, yeah. I, I think it's valid, though. I mean, I think a lot of bigger brands also caught the younger generation yeah. with social media. Yeah. because they, they get them hooked on things and then maybe they'll buy a lipstick. They can't afford the clothes, but they will definitely buy a lipstick or yeah. a, a wallet. Few. So it's a way of reeling people in, yeah. which I think works for those big companies. I think it's, it's like anything. There's all sorts of levels to it. You know? Yeah, I agree. It's the level of it that, that at least for me, I don't want to be associated with a, a certain level. But I don't mind the likes. The likes are... Uh, welcome. <laughs> but, uh, but just so you know, I mean, I know personally because we've looked at this. Um, apparently, when people are looking at companies to invest on, uh, and I know my brother-in-law works in the internet and he's, he develops things and everything, and the internet is all smoke and mirrors. There's no tangible product. We make things that you can touch and wear. And the internet, people will invest in it because of the amount of Twitter followers and because they're, they're called influencers, the reality is that they're not really buying anything. Yeah. But it's a totally inflated value of something, you know. Whereas with designers, they look at, you know, how many likes you got on your Facebook page for investors or banks or whatever. It's, it's crazy now mm -hmm. to see how influential you are. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's... it's I don't know how realistic it is because people can also look and not buy. I always say people consume with their eyes. They don't yeah. consume mm -hmm. with their wallets anymore. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yes. So there's this constant... Mm -hmm. Also with their Bombard. ears. With their they ears. consume with their ears. So if you're associated to a certain amount of celebrities and big names, yeah. then it's automatic that they just follow. Oh, yeah, that's the other word, follow. Do you work in social media? Uh, no, I actually work on 7th Avenue in a, in a showroom as a wholesale salesperson. Right. But I'm fascinated about the um, effect that social media has had on fashion mm. and mm -hmm. just the uh, amount of exposure that um, has been allowed to happen as a result of social media and just exposure um, and how it's changed fashion uh, with bloggers and videographers, yeah. you know. Well, a good, a good example of this is the video you saw. Because yes, it's, 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 it was a big surprise for all of us how many people have reached. Much more than a, than a physical runway show. Mm -hmm. And much more look. powerful, much more effective, mm -hmm. much more mm -hmm. how, what we want. So mm -hmm. there is that, that side was, of it for sure. I'm so sorry. To me, that was the perfect um, merging yeah. of uh, technology and the use of social media or media um, with something so pure and so beautiful. But... Um, it was exposed and it leapfrogged the usual group that would first see it. Mm -hmm. And um, so that's when, when I was talking about the impact of social media, like mm -hmm. both of you, again, are purists um, and you, um, you know, have, I don't want to say small businesses because the word small just has a negative connotation in that, but just for lack of a better word, but um, how it actually has allowed your businesses or what you are creating to be um, shown to the world mm -hmm. and to create just a bigger audience. I was just wondering mm -hmm. how, if social media had helped you or was impactful in that way. Yeah, I feel like it's the only way right now. The, the only way to reach a, a much bigger amount is through I that. I don't see it any other way at this point. Thank you. Um, hmm. I think, do we have time for another? Oh, I think it's we past have, 10 past 8. Oh, <laughs> I think we have to, I'm sorry, we have to, 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 to close. So thank you so much for uh, your questions coming. Thank you.